So what do you do again? Like what do you? And oh, they act like you you not you don't really have a job. Well, since you ain't working, can you can you go pick up the laundry and get the mail and go get the kids? And they, they don't respect what you're doing. They don't understand the fundamental reality, which is that every great empire that exists in America started as a figment of somebody's imagination. In order for this building to be built, somebody had to imagine this center and draw up the diagrams to build the center and then go get the brick and mortar and everything else it took to develop this structure that we're in. So in many ways, those who are truly committed to building for the black community are kind of seen as a little bit crazy because much of the empire that you see, all the vision that you see right now is a figment of your imagination. But I'm here to tell you that it's okay to be crazy. You need crazy people to build a nation. Because I can tell you this, I don't know the answers to every problem that we have as a community. I don't pretend to be that person, nor no will I ever be. But one thing that all of us can agree on, I would imagine, is that what we've been doing is not working. What we've done to this point has not worked. Many of us are trained from birth to be part of an economic and social and political cage that is built for you before you're even born. And so a lot of us are like animals in captivity. And we don't even know that we're born in the zoo. We really are the animal who lives in the zoo who really thinks he's free because he's never known what it means to be free. People that I know when they get free, when they get off the corporate plantation, when they get out here and they really start doing things for black folks, they can't go back. Animals understand freedom. You don't have to explain to an animal why it's better to be free than it is to be in a cage. Just let him out. You try to put him back in, he's not gonna go back. But many of our people are born in a cage. Think about this. I mean, the first thing that we do is we hand our children over to oppressors, to people who hated them for 400 years, and say, here, educate my baby. And then wonder why so many of our kids grow up screwed up. I mean, think about that. It takes about 187,000 hours to raise a baby from zero to the age of 18. And I do not understand how that child, in that 187,000 hours, they spend about 14,000 hours in school, and they get to the age of 18, and they can't read, can't write, can't do math, but somehow have memorized the lyrics of every song that comes on the radio. They have mastered nothingness. They have mastered all the things that are irrelevant to their development as a strong black person in this society. So the brainwashing runs deep. You're being exposed to propaganda every day. You're being educated in a specific way every day, whether you turn on the radio, turn on the TV, go to school, or work for that corporation, whatever it is, your thinking is being shaped. So the first thing that we have to do as a people, if we're ever gonna build anything, is we have to reclaim the education of our children in every single way. Now let me tell you this. When I'm talking to the people in this room and I'm looking in your eyes, what I'm really seeing are people that are kind of like what they call preaching to the choir. I don't think you would be here if you were lost. I don't think you'd even be here if you didn't, uh, if you were a person who needed to hear this information. And so what I really believe is that most of the black economic revolution is going to be led by people that I call the early adopters. The early adopters are the people who are kind of like economic soldiers. You think about the military. You don't need everybody to be a soldier. You just need a few good men and women. So my argument is that we as the economic soldiers, we as the choir, we as the people that are taking the lead on this, have a mandate to make sure that as we raise our children, we teach them to develop business, to develop structure, to really get the most out of their talents. We have to kill the old paradigm of what is considered to be black success, which is go to school, work hard, and get a job, and get 40 years to that job, and then you die at your desk, and then you disappear, and they replace you within a week and act like you were never there. That's not success. Somebody told you it was success, and it, it was so, for, for many of you, there was a point where you started thinking about it, you said, wait a minute, I'm, I'm, I think I'm successful, I was told I'm successful, but I don't feel successful. And that's because you're not. You were told that you were free, but you really are free. And so you, you had to kind of figure it all out as you went along. And so I would argue that what we can do for our children is make sure they don't have to go through that process. They're hearing this from birth. From the very beginning, for example, point blank period, no black child in America should be raised under the assumption that you're gonna grow up and work for somebody else. So from the minute your child learns how to say, mama, can I have some money? You don't say, well, boy, one day you gotta go up and get you a job. No, you say one day you gotta go up and start you a business. That's what you do. Now, if they wanna figure out how to go work for other people as part of their plan, that's fine. 
but that should be plan B. That should never be plan A. Additionally, I believe that black people can be successful, we can do whatever we want without changing a thing about who we are. We are already extraordinary people. I mean, let's be real. We, so, we are the descendants. We are the descendants of the survivors of the Middle Passage. We are the descendants of the survivors of the worst slavery, the worst atrocities in all of human history. They really can't kill us. The only people that can really kill black folks are other black people. That's why they train you to turn the gun on yourself. They saw hip hop as a tool for empowerment, so they flipped it over and said, let's use it as a tool to kill black people. So the fact is that they, they can't kill us. They can't take us down. Who we are is fine. It doesn't require an overhaul in terms of how we conduct ourselves. It simply requires modest tweaking, for example. I don't believe that it makes any sense whatsoever for a black boy to be to spend more time on the football field than he spends in a book or in the classroom or learning how to start a business. Black men are the most unemployed group of people in America, and the foundation, the core, the crux of the reason that your families are falling apart, and the reason the black women don't respect you anymore, is because you're out here as a man begging another man to feed your children. If I know that I'm the reason, if I'm the white man, I know I'm the reason that your children get to eat every day, you're not the man in your house. I'm the man in your house. So black men especially, black boys, when you're raising those boys, you must help them understand that ain't nothing out here for you, black man. Ain't no opportunities waiting for you, especially if you went to prison. No opportunities waiting. It's a lie. It's a false dream. It's some hope that's sprinkled in front of you to get you to behave just so long enough so you let your guard down so they can slaughter you. If you don't believe me, look around and see how many black men you see committing suicide on a daily basis. I'm not talking about killing themselves. Some of them actually killed themselves. I know a lot of former athletes gave everything to try to get to the NFL and found out at the last minute that there aren't that many jobs. I know a lot of guys out there who've actually killed themselves. I'm not talking about the guys who killed themselves blatantly. I'm talking about the guys who killed themselves slowly over time. Like the guy sitting at home every day, smoking weed, getting drunk every day, and his drawers playing Xbox in his mama's basement because a white man won't give him a job. Because he somehow has been led to believe that his free time, his 40 hours a week, that the white man might pay for, that somehow it has no value if white people have not acknowledged that value. Think about that. Why would he pay you to come to work 40 hours a week if your labor did not have value? So therefore, if he's not paying you for that labor, why are you not able to take that labor and apply it to something of your own and extract that value for yourself? If he's paying you $20 an hour, that probably means you're worth $70 an hour. So why aren't you equipped to take that labor and apply it to something that's gonna benefit your family directly as opposed to benefiting somebody else? A lot of it is because when you were a kid, you, were, you spent more time learning how to be a basketball player, football player, and a rapper than you spent learning how to be a man. And th so this is warfare, people. This is warfare. That which makes a man marryable, in many cases, has to do with his ability to provide for himself and provide for other people. That which gives the man pride is connected to his ability to provide. And I can tell you, I became deeply offended as I grew up and moved into manhood and started realizing, like, wait a minute, hold on, wait. In order for me to feel like a man, I gotta go beg this other man to take care of me like I'm a baby. I don't feel like a man right now, I feel like a little boy. I'm feeling kind of like a bitch right now. <laughs> So what I'm saying to you is that the, the very basis of the assumptions that we make about what it means to succeed in this society have to go out the window. But about 70 to 80% of the so-called successful black people we see every day really aren't successful. They are successful. What they are are individuals who've been given financial rewards for bowing down and supporting white supremacist institutions. If you know anything about white supremacy, if you know anything about capitalism, you understand systems reward you for supporting the system. If you reject the system or question the system or challenge the system, the system's designed to spit you out. So in many cases, the successful black person is not the one who got to the top of the pile. A lot of times it's the, it's the person that got booted out. But because we are so trained to think in a specific way about what black success really means, because we've been taught to mistake success for assimilation, we will often celebrate the least successful people 
One good example might be right here in LA, the guy named Lee Daniels who makes that stupid show Empire. <laughs> Just run right here, humiliating your community, making all these movies that, that, are, that are incredibly disrespectful to black people. But many black people consider him to be a role model or consider him to be a successful man because some white guy wrote him a check. We need to get off of that. We need to let that go right now and challenge those people for that kind of behavior. Now let me say this to you. Let me, let, let's get into some specifics on some strategies that we can apply uh, in order to do what we have to do. Now, now one of the people that I love the most and respect the most is, is uh, who uh, uh, Dr. Mul Mulligan, uh, Mill Milligan, right? Mill I'll make sure I get the right. Sorry, Milligan, okay. I didn't mean to mis mis uh, mispronounce the name, forgive me. Uh, that Dr. Milligan mentions Dr. Claude Anderson. Yes. And one of the things, yes, please. And Dr. Anderson wrote a book, uh, a, couple, a lot of books, but one of the books I consider to be one of the greatest uh, books ever written in the history of this, of this world, uh, Black Labor, White Wealth, another one we know, Poweronomics. And one of the things that Dr. Anderson talks about, uh, specifically, that, that I think we want to really focus on and meditate on, is the fact that we need leadership that does, as, as, as Mr. Brown did earlier, that has a plan. You know, the problem is we have too many leaders that will hoot and holler and complain and get everybody riled up and then nothing happens afterward. There's no sort of structured, systematic, step-by-step, day-to-day process that we can all follow that will help us achieve the empowerment that we're looking for. The other thing that we have to just accept right now, at least in this generation, is that we're not, we're not the popular kids on the block. You know, there, there'll never be a day where we're speaking about this stuff, not in our lifetime, where this room is as full as it would be if there was a Beyonce concert or something like that. So, my argument would be that as we move forward, rather than always feeling that we have to carry the burden of saving an entire community and carrying all that on our backs, we can do what we need to do individually within our sphere of influence to develop economic strength and security in our own families. People often talk about building the next Black Wall Street. How do you build a new Black Wall Street? And a lot of times what they're visualizing is something that is tough to accomplish. They're visualizing something that's, that's worth hundreds of millions of dollars and consists of you know, a lot of uh, buildings and shops and everything else all up and down the block. And I believe that those will exist over time. But if you study how e economies work, you realize that an economy can be giant or it can be small, but the dynamics can be very much the same. So a black Wall Street is, does not have to be brick and mortar buildings. A black Wall Street can also be digital. Like all, when I look at technology and I see what's happening on the internet, where black people coming together to form digital villages and talking to each other every day, it's, it's really powerful and transformative. There, most black people who know anything about me now would never know about me were it not for technology. Because they're not gonna let a Negro like me on TV. That ain't gonna happen. That we know that. If I, if I have a show, I'd lose that show in about a week. Right? And so, so technology is one of the avenues of possibility that exists for us. And also, it is an avenue for wealth building in terms of the ability of us to do business with each other. And actually, you may not know this, but 80% of the wealth generated on this planet has been generated, in the, the last two years has been generated in Silicon Valley. So our children are aiming for the wrong dreams. I would argue that if we generate children who are masters of technology and entrepreneurship, then those individuals will create the next Snapchat. They will create the next Facebook. They will create whatever. But, but what we have to do as a community as well is we have to create fertile soil for black entrepreneurs so that those businesses can grow. Because imagine this, imagine you have a kid that's at a, a HBCU and he's really good with computers and, and he's, as, he's as smart as Mark Zuckerberg who created Facebook and he says, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really good at computers, I have this great idea, here's what I'm gonna do. Is he really gonna usually get support from every black person he sees to say, you know, you can create a billion dollar company or somebody gonna say, you know, Pookie, you good with computers. You, you know, they will pay you 200,000 a year to go work at IBM. That's what they do, that's what I was told, that's what people like me were told. So we have to have fertile soil, we also have to understand how economies work and what that really means. So one of the things that I can share with you is a model 
that I believe will, in a very basic, simple way, allow you to ensure that any child that is in your sphere of influence, your children, your grandchildren, anybody else, will have a very high probability of becoming a millionaire by between the ages of 30 and 40. And the model is very basic. It's the word KID, K-I-D. I came with this model just for black people. It's very easy to implement. The K stands for knowledge. I stands for investment. D stands for discipline. Knowledge, investment, discipline, kid. What does the knowledge part mean? Well, the knowledge means that your child's understanding of financial literacy and wealth building should start at an early age. It should be as fundamental as our commitment to sports and entertainment. It should be as fundamental as going to church every Sunday. If you ask, if you ask a kid who grew up in a church, when's the first time your grandma took you to church? They won't remember. Well, I would argue that we should have children where they can't remember the first time their parents taught them about economic intelligence or how to start a business. It should be a part of the culture. They should also have some degree of financial literacy training at an early age, and every black child in America should know how to start their own business by the age of 12. Just as a rite of passage. And it is fundamental to their responsibility. There was a mother who came to, uh, we had something in uh, Los Angeles about uh, two months ago, and there was a mother who came in and she showed me video of her four-year-old twin sons, and they had memorized, we had given them a little curriculum, we have curriculum and stuff like that online, which uh, Michelle can tell you about that if you're interested, but we had um, a curriculum, and she showed me video of her four-year-old sons reciting the curriculum, you know, and, and she said, it's some, she said, sometimes it's hard because my, the other parents think I'm too serious, and because I don't let my kids watch TV, I don't let them eat garbage like McDonald's, stuff like that. I make sure they're learning financial literacy and not Nicki Minaj lyrics. And, and I said, I said, you know what? I said, you are, you, you're the key to all of this. Because the mother is the key to everything. The mother is the first master teacher. And then the father, we come in second. But we know we can't do this without the mothers getting on board with these ideas. And I said, what you've basically done is you have guaranteed that your sons will never be unemployed. A person who knows how to think entrepreneurially from a fundamental subconscious level is a person who's able to see opportunity everywhere. They can walk into a room where there's no money and see wealth everywhere. It's like, it's like the difference, the difference between somebody who knows how to just hunt for a job versus somebody who knows how to start their own business. It's like the difference between somebody who only feels like they can eat when the restaurants are closed excuse me, or open, versus somebody who knows how to grow their own food, hunt their own food, cook their own food. Who's gonna eat better? Who's got more food security? The person who only knows how to go to McDonald's and Burger King, or the person who knows how to grow and cook their own food? And here's the, here's the thing though, a lot of us, I don't know about y'all, I don't know about, I can't speak for people in this room, but a lot of y'all were raised in wonderful families that had, that where consciousness was taught to you at an early age. I wasn't, I wasn't in that family. I was raised in a very typical, stereotypical family where I was taught a lot of the wrong things. I picked up these ideas in my 30s, so I don't have the advantage that our children can have because it took a long time for me to unprogram myself from all the other crap I would learned and reprogram myself into something that was actually going to help me succeed in this country. Because here's the thing about your brain. Your brain, did you know that there's not, if they took every supercomputer on the planet and put them all together, they could not simulate one human brain. So you literally are walking around with a supercomputer on your head. And the most powerful part of that supercomputer is the part that you don't even see. It's the subconscious mind. So the messages that you get at an early age shape you in ways that you can't even imagine. So my argument, my belief, is that with our children, we hit the subconscious early, we hit it hard, we hit it consistently with messages of empowerment, economic intelligence, and all the things they're gonna need in order to be successful. Because the thing you got to understand is that economics is not a nice game to play, it's warfare. Global economic warfare is what runs this country. Economic protectionism is what occurs in every single community. Black people, unfortunately, many of us did not get the memo. In fact, a lot of us, when you drop your child in the middle of an economic system and they've never been trained on economics, that's like dropping them in the middle of the Super Bowl and they've never seen a football. They've never had football practice. They don't know which end zone is theirs. They don't know how to score points. You put that child in that situation, they are going to get killed. 
And so what's going to happen to that child? You're dropped in the middle of the Super Bowl. You're not prepared to play. You don't know what to do. You don't have any shoulder pads. You don't even know what a football looks like. You don't know the difference between the referee and the cheerleaders versus the people in the stands. Well, you're going to end up having to serve a master who will offer to protect you. Or you're going to walk up to your opponent and say, well, can you explain the rules of this game to me? And they'll say, sure. So well, the first thing you got to do is every time you get the ball, you're supposed to give it to me. Right? Don't worry about scoring your own points. I'll score all the points, and I'll give you some points. And then you wonder why every game ends with, with you losing 187 to 2. You wonder why, but that's what we do. <clears throat> when we send our children into the economic system, a competitive global economic system without economic training, we are putting them in the middle of a battlefield without a gun, without a shield, without a strategy, without training, without nothing. So when you're in that situation, all you can do is serve people who offer to protect you, and you will end up learning the rules of that battlefield from the people who are going to oppress you in exchange for that information or exchange for that protection. And the information they give you is going to be false. That's what we're doing when we're learning how to play the game of economics from the people who hate us the most, who live off of our exploitation. You see, capitalism, capitalism is a lot like, and I'm going to get back to the kid model. I promise you, like, when I go on tangents, I go long circles, and then I, come, I always come back there. I'm good. Chalk it up to my ADHD. That's what it is. <laughs> capitalism. It's a lot like, um, think about the Kentucky Derby. Capitalism is a, a horse and jockey race. You think about a horse race, the jockey is training the horse, and he's whipping the horse, he's riding the horse, and, and he wins the race. And when the race is over, they don't give the trophy and the money to the horse. They give the horse some hay, and they put him in the barn, and when he gets too old, they kill him, or, they, or he gets out of line, they shoot him, or he breaks his leg, they kill him, whatever it is, right? They give all the rewards to the jockey. And so, if you look at capitalism, the reason I compare it to a horse and jockey situation is that you have people in the system who are trained to be jockeys, and then you have people in the system who are trained to be horses. See, if think about this. When you have an apartment and you pay rent to the landlord, it's, it's an amazing kind of thing. I almost want to call it a mindfuck, but I'm trying not to cuss today, so I won't say that. <laughs> think about this. You're spending years paying rent to buy a home that's going to be owned by somebody else. If you give your landlord, say, $1,000 a month in rent, I did this for my students the other day. I was doing the math. I was freaking out as I was looking at this. I said, imagine you paid $1,000 a month in rent and you did that for 30 years. And somebody took that money and they put it in the stock market and it grew at the rate that the stock market normally grows. I said, did you realize that you've actually given them about $3.2 million? over that time. So you have bought your landlord three mansions. But that same person will say, I can't afford to buy a home. Hmm. He's got to pay rent. Right, he's got to pay rent, right? <laughs> He'll say, I can't afford to buy a home, but I'll be like, well, you know mathematically, you actually just bought your landlord at least two houses, maybe three. Again, jockey, horse. Think about working for somebody. When you go to work for somebody, you work hard, you bust your butt every day, you give your life to that corporation. And at the end, you own nothing. You're getting, you're getting the temporary gratification of the paycheck. They're getting the long-term validation of ownership, which is something they can pass to their children. You put 40 years into that company. You die at your desk. And then they replace you, and your children are started over from ground zero all over again. Happens all the time. right? We, we've seen this play out. So in many ways, we are trained not to be economic owners and economic uh, captains of industry. We are trained to be economic babysitters. We manage assets for other people, and they get all the benefits. You keep going, let's look at the stock market. What are the reasons for the growth in, in the wealth gap between the rich and, and, mid, and middle class people? And I studied this. Right? And, and, and I'm not talking about people who just were given a bunch of money, like a Donald Trump type. I'm talking about people that actually earn their wealth. People like Mr. Brown, who actually built wealth over time. I'm th I'm th I mean, he's a, people like him are in that category. The reason for the gap and the reason it has grown is because wealthier people tend to take money and put it in the stock market. And the stock market, since the Obama presidency began, has shot through the roof. And the Trump presidency, it continued to shoot through the roof. And the reason for that is because you have a government that prioritizes certain things over other things. 
If I, t if I go to the President of the United States, I don't care if it's Obama or anybody else, Trump, it don't matter, and I say, you know, Mr. President, 200 young people got shot and murdered in Chicago this weekend, they're gonna say, oh, well, that's, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, what's the next issue? They're not gonna care. But if I say, Mr. President, you know the stock market dropped by 3% last night, it's a crisis, that'll be the top of their priority list. That's what you're dealing with. So ultimately, when you even talk about the stock market being part of that horse and jockey situation, well, look, when you're trained to consume consumer items or to take in consumer items, they have psychologists that study how you think so they can get you to make the emotional purchases and all these things. They got it broken down to a science and you buy the consumer items because it makes you feel better, makes you feel validated. In fact, they say poor people and black people are most vulnerable to these mind tricks because subconsciously you believe that if I dress like a rich person, I won't be treated like a nigga. If I, if white people believe, poor white people believe, if I dress like I have money, then I'll be treated better. So the same effect that they use on us is what they use on poor white people as well, and it works. And the horse and jockey system comes into play because when you go out and you transact with someone to buy a new pair of shoes or some kind of expensive outfit, you've given them real money, real cash uh, that allows them to invest and build wealth for their kids, and they've given you a pair of sneakers. They've given you this new suit. They've given you something that you're not going to remember five, ten years down the line. So ultimately, what we have to do is start really thinking about this because this represents what Dr. Anderson had called the doctrine of unequal exchange. It was used in Africa by the Europeans. It's still used by Europeans on black people today. So knowledge, KID, knowledge includes understanding all of this, understanding the difference between a producer and a consumer, understanding what it means to be an investor, understanding all these things. What does the I stand for? The I stands for investment. Now, where does that come from? Investment means that when you have all the strategy and all the information about how to win the game, you gotta have something to play with. You gotta have some tools. It's easier to play, to have some tools. It's like a basketball coach. You can be the greatest basketball coach in the world, but if you don't have good players, then you're not gonna win any games. Well, the same thing is true with wealth building. As your child acquires all this knowledge that you're going to give them about how the economy works, what it means to make money, what it means to own assets, how all these, how all these dynamics play out, you want to, in the background, be making consistent strategic investments so that by the time they hit a certain age, they will have liquid wealth that allows them to make moves. Now I'm going to use an example that's probably going to piss you off, but I'm going to use it anyway because this is important to understand because this is going to play out in the long, next 50, 100 years. I studied the history of Donald Trump. When every black person was getting mad about Trump being president, and I don't like the guy, I think he's a jerk, he's arrogant, but I've always felt that way, even before he got into politics. Uh, I don't really care so much about whether I like you or not. I need to know how to compete against you. And if you got something that, that we can't get, I want to know how you got it. Again, maybe that's another reason Dr. Anderson and I get along is because if you read Black Labor, White Wealth, that's what he says. If you want to understand how to compete with your oppressor, you must understand how the oppressor got the power. So I look back at Donald Trump's life from the time, not to him, but his daddy actually, Fred Trump. And I went all the way back to 1913 when Fred was born. And I saw in 1936, Fred was, uh, he, he, I think when he was a, when he was a kid, his, um, his uh, father died. So he, 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 had a, he was a fatherless child. He was working as a carpenter's helper. And then he made a decision to, instead of just working as a carpenter's helper, helper he said, I'm going to get some skills to become a carpenter. Then after that, he said, instead of working as a carpenter, I'm actually going to own uh, I'm going to take some time to own some buildings and start renting them out and stuff like that. And so as a result of those strategic moves, by the time Donald was born in 1946, his father had laid a foundation of wealth for him. So then what he did, which is really interesting, he applied that KID model that I'm describing to you. Donald, he's a jerk, he's arrogant, he's, he, I don't like the man. But his father made sure he was trained for economic warfare. By the time Donald was 18, 19, he had him going to military school, then he had him going to another university to learn economics and learn how to run a business. And by the time he was 25, he wasn't playing Strugglenomics, he was running the Trump Organization and able to make moves at the age of 25 that a lot of young people can't make. He wasn't thinking like, how do I get my next job so I can get by? He was thinking, okay, how do I buy this property so I can then leverage that 
that investment and go buy something else. He was making major moves. Now here's the thing, here's the reason that you want to think about this a little bit and get get out get inside, get outside your feelings about how you feel about Trump or black people dislike. I don't get into politics, I don't care about any of that. Black people ain't gonna be saved by no politicians. Democrat or Republican. I don't care. Here's the thing. When I saw Donald Trump up there you know, when he won the presidency, and he had his son up there, his son's name was Barron. And I, I said, wow, that's an interesting name because a baron is a leader, that's royalty. And names have power, the subconscious mind, once again. That's why children who are named Denise and Dennis are far more, far more likely to become dentists. And if you ask them, well, why did you become a dentist? They're, gonna, they're, they're not going to have any idea that their name may have played a part. They're going to say, oh, well, it's because I like teeth, or it's because I, you know, I, I thought the money was good. No, it's your subconscious mind. In your mind, you've always been called dentist. So you say, oh, I'm a dentist. That's why names like king and queen and stuff like that are really, really important. So Donald says, my son's name is Baron. And right now, he's not training Baron on how to get a job. He's not training Baron on how to work for other people. He's training Baron on how to be an economic leader. And so what's going to happen is 50 years down the line, your child is going to run into the Baron Trumps of the world. And my question is, when they run into that scenario, when they go head to head with that, with that lineage of evil, are they going to be prepared to fight back or are they, are they going to have to bow down? Are you going to be able to stand up to a Baron Trump, your child, grandchild, or are you going to have to go beg him for a job? How you prepare will make all the difference in the world. In the art of war, Sun Tzu, in the art of war, he says that battles are won before they begin. So the battle, so the presidency of the United States wasn't won in 2017. It was won in 1936. So the battles that will occur in the year 2087 and 2097 are the ones that we're trying to live today. So what you want to do with your child, if you want them to be economically prepared, is very basic. Invest at least $5 a day on average in the stock market for that child. Now I can't predict what the stock market is going to do in the future. Nobody can. I looked at all the research and the theory. You can't do that. But I can tell you what's happened in the past. And I can tell you that if a person had put $5 a day into the stock market in, say, the 1980s and did that for 10 years, after about 10 years, they'd have about $29,000 in liquid assets, about 11000 of that would be interest. 18000 that's the money you put in. The rest is money growing on top of money. Understanding capital. Capital is supposed to grow. You're not supposed to give it away. You're supposed to let it grow. After 20 years, it would grow to about $102,000 of which only 36,000 is what you put in. The rest is the interest from your money growing. 30 years, that number becomes 281,000, of which about 54,000, I think, is the money that you're actually putting in for yourself. 40 years, the number grows to three quarters of a million dollars, of which about 78,000 is what you actually put in yourself. So if you're doing that for your child, what you've done is you've given them the knowledge on how economics works and the investment which gives them tools. Your child hits the age of 30, they got a quarter million dollars in liquid assets, now they're ready to fight. Now, if they have a great business idea, they don't have to say, well, I, I, got, a, I got a great idea, but I can't get $3,000. No, they've got the assets and they've got the know-how. They're not gonna be an economic victim. Think about your own life. Think about how differently your life would have gone if you'd had a couple hundred thousand dollars in assets to play with as you were making moves at the age of 20, age of, age of, age of 19, age of 20. It makes all the difference in the world. This is not hard to do. I've done the math. It's hard to believe because people just think that it's, it's, it's nonsense because there's so many people who are addicted to believing that black people just simply can't get out of the hole, that we can't succeed. But here's the thing about America. Let me tell you this. Most Americans are not financially literate. Most Americans are, do not understand the things that we talk about with you every day. So our window of opportunity is for us to make sure our children take the lead and get out front in terms of understanding wealth building and cooperative economics and investing and entrepreneurship. If we do that, oh, we'll be, we'll be beyond where the Jews are because we're, we're, we're greater people than anybody on this earth. And I bet you that if we embrace these ideas, we won't be able to be touched. Let me go to the last part, and she's telling me I got five minutes, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this quick, but I gotta tell you this. KID, the D stands for discipline. Knowledge and investment mean nothing if you don't have discipline. If your children don't have economic discipline, 
then what's going to happen is they're going to end up a lot like the fat gym teacher. You know, the guy, the per the guy who knows everything he's supposed to do to lose weight, but he's not actually doing it. That's where they're going to end up. They're going to say, well, I know what I need to do with my money, but I just, I just kind of wasted it because I had to get that Mercedes or whatever. A lot of discipline is defined primarily by the ability to delay gratification. That's been lost in our children. So many of our kids, I feel so sorry for these poor children because they are, are going to get economically slaughtered because they have no ability to wait or to invest or to do things today so they can have a better life tomorrow. Here's where discipline comes into play. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Number one, if I was to define any of the things that helped me to do well in, in my life, and I'm not bragging, I'm, I'm very humble when I say that, any of the things that allowed me to kind of have a little bit or have some things work out in my favor, a lot of it traces back to a commitment I made when I was young, when I told my mama when I was sitting in school, because I was in school such a long time. I, I didn't even finish school until I was 30. You know, I go to family reunions and my relatives would be like, so you still in school, huh? <laughs> And, and at that time, I didn't know other tools to, to fight white supremacy. I thought education was the main tool, so I just wanted to get as much as possible. But my, my, my main rule was, I said, I want to spend a few years living like nobody else will, so I can spend the rest of my life living like nobody else can. And here's an example, here's a study that helps you understand how delayed gratification, the ability to delay gratification, plays a huge role in your child's likelihood of success. They did a study at Stanford called the Stanford Marshmallow Study. Anybody heard about the Stanford Marshmallow Study? Mr. Brown has, because he knows everything. All right, he's, a, he's a brilliant black man, I can tell that. So the Stanford Marshmallow Study, let me tell you about it. What they did was they, they took some kids in a room and they wanted to torture the kids a little bit. So they, they in the room they put a table, a chair, a plate, and a marshmallow. And that's it. And so what they, they didn't have a clock in the room. So, when uh, the experiment was about to start the experiment, they, they thought they were going to do something else. But actually, they were testing the child's ability to delay gratification. So the experimenter would always say, well, oh, wait, you know, I forgot something. I got to go to my office. I'll be back in 10 minutes. And if you, so you can eat the marshmallow now if you want to. But if you can wait for 10 minutes till I get back, I'll give you three marshmallows. So the experimenter would leave, and they would film the child to just see how the child responded. Now some of the kids, it was just like, you know, YOLO, you know, they ate the marshmallow. They were done, they, like, you only did once, gotta get this marshmallow while it getting good. And then you had some of the kids who maybe wanted to eat it, but they, they knew that there was a bigger reward waiting and they could just hold on. So they would do all kinds of little stuff to try to distract themselves. Like they would start singing, la 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 la. Like five little kids are cute. Like they'll, they'd start pedaling their feet, looking away, and you know, whatever, whatever it took to focus on something other than eating that marshmallow. And so what they did was they took the kids and they put them in two groups. They put the, the marshmallow eaters in one group and the ones who could wait in the other group. And they followed these children throughout their lives. And the study's results, which you might be able to predict, were that the children who were in the delayed gratification group, who understood how to delay gratification, how to wait for the big reward, were more successful than the kids in the other category in almost every measure of quality of life. They, their, their marriages lasted longer, they were in better shape, they made more money, they were happier, all of that. So if you have a child that has knowledge, assets, and discipline, meaning mental toughness, for especially, especially for the, we know that the sisters get the mental toughness a lot because unfortunately with the way our families are structured, a lot of black women get to grow up with their primary role model in the household. So they learn a lot of strength from looking at mama every day. A lot of our boys are weak. A lot of our boys have turned into something that I wouldn't let marry my daughter in a million years. Mm. So at the end of the day, this mental toughness piece, this ability to delay gratification, this ability to focus on what you want is critical. If a child has those three elements, then there's a very high probability that they're going to be a millionaire, there's, but there's an even, even greater probability, and this is what matters, that they're going to be an asset to their community. You see, because we got a whole lot of so-called successful black people. They got PhDs, JDs, MBAs, and all kinds of letters behind their name that make them feel like they're better than other people. We got a whole lot of black people on TV. We got a whole lot of black elected officials. We don't need more of any of that. We know the Congressional Black Caucus is about the most worthless piece of crap in the history of the world. We know that. What we need are more successful black people who care about the black community. That's what we need.
Now, I've been told that my time is up. And, uh, and I want to say uh, thank you all uh, for giving me this time. Thank you for giving, giving me your attention. It is an honor and a privilege to uh, join you here. And uh, I just want to say keep on keeping on. Because whether it's tomorrow, next month, next year, or in 200 years, we're going to win this fight. Because they can't, they can't hold us back forever.